Welcome to Democracy Nerd. We're going to start today with a news update. And it's a news update that might have gone unnoticed even by some other democracy nerds. A little bit earlier this month, a federal judge in North Dakota blocked a suit that attempted to prevent ballots postmarked prior to Election Day, but received after from being counted. Effectively, the judge determined that, yes, indeed, ballots submitted by Election Day should be counted. The suit, along with a similar one in Mississippi, is the opening salvo of what could be a long and probably will be legally contentious battle over access to the ballot in this coming presidential elections. One of the organizations committed to ensuring ballot access is the Campaign Legal Center. And we are lucky to be joined today by Paul Smith, no relation as far as I can tell, the center's <laughs> senior vice president, providing an update on the legal strategy, ensuring the right to vote in this coming election. And why it's necessary to persuade judges that ballots cast before Election Day should be counted. Hello, Paul, and welcome to Democracy Nerd. Hi, Jeff. Happy to be here. So before we start uh, and talk about your work at the Campaign Legal Center, let's talk about the North Dakota case. I mentioned it briefly. Correct anything I got wrong or amplify what people should know. Right. No, it's a, there's a federal statute that says the presidential election is held on the, whatever that second Tuesday in November is. Uh, and the Constitution says Congress can set the day of the election. And the argument in the case was you have to actually have your ballot in the hands of a state voting officials by election day. Uh, and so all the states, and there are quite a few who allow you to vote by mail before the election. And it, as long as the ballot comes in by a deadline some days later after the election the, and count those ballots, that they shouldn't be counting those ballots. That's the argument the, 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 the case made. And why is it being brought to a federal appeals court? I, mean, I, I, I assume that it's a federal case. They're making a federal case, so even though it's state law. They're saying, what's the what's the federal law that they're relying upon to try to disturb how states are counting their ballots? It's a federal statute that sets the date for the election, and they're basically arguing that when Congress said the election has to be on X date. They, they included a requirement that the ballots be in the hands of state officials by that date, whereas many, many states say you voted when you put your ballot in the mail. So they think it's timely if you if it's postmarked before the election. And there's no reason not to count those votes. It's just uh, they're, they're, the theory of the case, though, is we shouldn't let all those vote, votes get counted. And I don't have it in front of me, and I should have looked it up since I have now the curiosity. But do you? And it's probably unfair to ask you because you may not have it on the tip of your fingers. But do we? Do we? What's the statutory language? Does it? What if that's so, what they're going to be arguing? What does like, the uh, statute uh, actually say? First Tuesday after the first Monday in November, or something like that. There's a there's a little bit of a complicated phraseology. Is the day when all states should select their electors. Uh, they don't actually have to have an election. They have to pick their electors on all on the same day whatever process they've established. Uh, and so it's really just an argument about the interpretation of this federal statute. And if uh, it gets interpreted authoritatively by the Supreme Court as not allowing these uh, late arriving absentee votes uh, based on a postmark, then there'll be that many fewer people voting by mail. And the show, after all, is called Democracy Nerd, not Democracy Just Across the Treetops. So it's worth trying to get, trying to dig into it. That the federal statute only says when electors should be selected and it does not say when votes should be cast by or when votes should be counted by. It doesn't have any specific language about this particular issue, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't contradict allowing these votes to be counted either. And it's been understood for many, many years that a state is permitted to say you cast your vote when you, when you deposited your ballot in the mail uh, and you no longer have any control of it. And the state laws tend to say it has to arrive within a certain number of days after the election, but they certainly, it's a very common thing to allow votes to come in based on a postmark before the election or on election day. And, have, and still have those votes get counted. All right. So as I understand, an auditor in a county in North Dakota expressed some confusion about the federal and state laws, and the auditor didn't you know, noted that there were criminal penalties if they made the wrong decision. North Dakota law allows state canvassing boards to accept and count ballots 
up to 13 days after the election day with the ballots providing they had been postmarked by election day. Uh, they can't have been mailed in afterwards. Uh, why was this auditor confused about accepting the ballot submitted but not received? I, I don't know that I think confused was the is the right term. He, All right. he was part of an effort by the, the lawyers who filed this case to make some law to say that state laws permitting ba absentee ballots to arrive after Election Day are invalid under the uh, supreme mess, uh, meaning of the federal law. Uh, and it's all part of an effort to cut back on absentee voting because these days more Democrats do that than Republicans. Uh, that is the the essence of the of the problem. Uh, the, these are lawyers trying to use the law to tailor the electorate uh, in a way they'd like to be tailored. Which voters would have impacted the most if the challenge had been upheld? So presumably absentee voters, overseas voters, members of the military, homebound seniors. And you're saying, and is it those four groups that yeah. are, end up end up tilting away from the direction that the litigants in the case wish they were tilting? That is that they seem like they more, more likely might be Joe Biden voters or well, is it about overseas military or homebound seniors, but certainly in general, in the Trump era, People who vote by mail uh, skew strongly toward the Democratic Party and, and away from the Republican Party, precisely because Donald Trump has uh, taught the message that voting by mail is a bad thing. And so we we now see it, which is a complete reversal, by the way, of the pattern that used to exist where Republicans relied on voting by mail uh, in some very key states. Uh, but so we know that the the, the the people who actually choose to vote by mail, uh, sometimes it's, it's called absentee ballots, sometimes it's called voting by mail, uh, in many states uh, skew strongly toward the Democrats. So they state they want to return to Election Day being just a day. And I know I'm, I'm going to try to ask questions about this, but I, I mean, the challenge I have is that even my asking, well, what are their arguments is really just pretending there are actually arguments that are <laughs> what matters, right? I mean, I, I understand that what really they're looking at is and what's driving now voting policy, uh, particularly for those trying to limit access to the ballot, is really just, well, who's voting and who's not? We got to rig the system so the people who will vote for us are the people whose votes are counted. And so it almost feels like I'm dancing on the head of a pin trying to understand the legal arguments because they seem like, I mean, do they even matter? Well, eventually they will matter when a court decides the case. In this case in North Dakota, all that the judge said was, you don't have any injury. You don't have any basis to sue. You, you should just follow the law. And if you're not sure what the governing law is, uh, you should ask somebody for advice. So the case got thrown out on based on a lack of standing, actually. They didn't really reach the merits. But someday there may be a case that gets up to the Supreme Court and will, will, the, the court will rule based on its interpretation of the statute. Uh, I think it's quite unlikely they're going to say a state isn't permitted to um, allow this this practice of having votes come in after Election Day that they're postmarked before, because the alternative is really dumb. Requiring people to put their ballot at risk based on the vagaries of the ma of the mails will discourage people from voting by mail. And maybe that's what the 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 plaintiffs really want, because then, you know, you don't know what, when you vote, even if you vote a, a week ahead of the election. Did the ballot get there in time? And, and was my vote counted? You probably never know. The case was, uh, I don't know, brought or supported by the Public Interest Legal Foundation. The title of that sounds like something Ralph Nader started 40 years ago. My guess is that is not the case. Who are these people who funds them? What do they want? Not so much uh, the same thing. Now, these are, the, if you look at the board of this this organization, these are people who have been advocating efforts to um, suppress voting uh, of one sort or another for a long time. They are people who have been talking about how there's mass voter fraud out there, uh, an argument that was used all the way back to the 90s to justify uh, voter ID laws, which were thought to skew in favor of the Republicans and against Democrats uh, and uh, against people of color. Uh, and and more recently now, they're coming up with other legal theories to try to tailor the electorate in, in favor of, uh, of, of their preferred uh, side of the aisle. So it, 
is the, do they use an originalist argument? What is their what is the kind of the thrust of their argument? Because you know, in the early days, it would literally take months to count all the votes cast in a presidential election in the early U.S. So if they say, "Oh, we've got to do it like it used to be done," I don't know. It doesn't seem like to be any faster. Well, of course, counting them is one thing. That's the, the other thing is receiving them. Uh, so the, the early days may not be quite the same thing. It is true that they <clears throat> took a long time to count when you had to count everything by hand. Um, but uh, th since this is interpreting a statute, not the Constitution, it's not so much about originalism. It's just sitting down and reading the words of the statute, maybe looking at what Congress had in mind when it passed it. Uh, and certainly, I think in this case, you would look at the fact that states have been permitting this for many, many, many years. Congress has never had any objection to it. And so the, 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 there's nothing in the language of the statute that would say, there's anything wrong with saying you voted on the minute you put the ballot into the mail. Uh, so I think the outcome of the case ultimately will likely be to uphold this practice uh, as the sensible thing that's been around for an awful long time. Now, in another universe, and by that I mean in, a, in any number of universes, where either there had been, rel relatively speaking, balanced appointments of <laughs> Supreme Court justices or in a world where Supreme Court justices have been selected in rough comparison to the presidents who have actually been elected, or another universe where the composition of the Supreme Court could be predicted by what the popular vote in the United States has been over the last 40 years, roughly speaking, or in another universe where Supreme Court justices were selected by lot from anybody who'd passed the bar or had gotten a certain LSAT score or who'd served as a judge at some other level or had some kind words said to them by bar association somewhere, I would have no real concern. I'd have not even strong curiosity about the result of this case, only in a world where you have a packed court of six conservative Supreme Court justices in contravention, in, in surprise result relative to everything else I just said, would I imagine that they could twist themselves into such a way that could try to suggest that no, no, uh, absentee ballots, uh, homebound seniors, and members of the military overseas can't vote, as you try to predict, but that's the world we are in, in, the, in terms of the court. As you attempt to predict how do you predict? If you put a percentage on it, what's the what's the risk? What's the risk interval here? The one thing I never try to do is put a percentage on a Supreme sure. Court prediction. Uh, and you know, I think we'll have to see how this all develops. I, I do think that even in the in the court we have, which is uh, conservative, as you say, and not always voting rights friendly, this claim is not going to work. Yeah. So what do we learn from it? What's to be? If you think this, if, if so far. They're not, it's not working. Uh, do you think, what's what's behind it then? Or what's the outcome that they hope is that eventually they try 10 different arguments and one works, even if it surprises everybody? Uh, is it a long it, shot, but that doesn't mean it's, it's, it's not worth trying. Sure, yeah. that's what lawyers do. From my understanding, there's a similar case underway in Mississippi right now. Is it essentially the exact same issue? regarding bail ballots uh, mailed before, excuse me, but not received until after election day and also from the same folks from this public interest legal foundation? Uh, I think it is the same folks, but I'm not 100% sure who filed it down there. We're not involved in that case as we were in, in North Dakota, but uh, I, I think it is the same people. And it's essentially the same issue. Each of the two state laws have different deadlines after the election by which the ballot has to come in the mail. But the same it's the same argument that federal law says you have to vote by a certain day and if you voting by mail doesn't count as voting who funds the public interest legal foundation do we know that i don't know so that's worth finding out yeah well, the, the uh, it's a I c3 mean, you could probably look up some information about them on their uh, yeah uh, i i googled it quickly and didn't come up with a and didn't come up with a quick answer. They're in Alexandria, Virginia, and my, so my my guess would be Koch Brothers, but I don't want I don't want that my my yeah. jaundiced uh, my jaundiced eye to make predictions that don't bear out relative to facts. So that's some of the latest news. Let us ask about your story. Was the path that led you to and from I think Yale Law School and to and from uh, Justice Powell to helping defend voting rights and access to the ballot and doing what you're doing now. Yeah, well, I was in private practice for a lot of years and argued a lot of cases in the Supreme Court um, and had a really- Where did you practice, if you don't mind me asking? In, 
in DC. Uh, what, what law firm? In a firm called uh, Jenner and Block. Sure, I know Jenner and Block. So I did. I did a summer at Covington, and uh, and I, I I didn't clerk at the Supreme Court, but I clerk on the Ninth Circuit. So I I I know and I know I, the big law world a little bit. And I was head of the Supreme Court appellate practice for a long time at, at yeah. Jenner. Uh, had a wonderful uh, practice, but one of the things we added to that practice along about 2000 was election law, uh, which we tried to make a business out of for a while, litigating redistricting cases uh, for the primarily for people on the Democratic side, but also for some, uh, you know, the city of Chicago and others. Uh, and eventually that led me to be more involved in other kinds of voting rights cases and voter ID cases and in uh, other cases about suppressing the vote. Uh, and uh, long about uh, the end of 2016, I was going to come teach at Georgetown Law School and leave private practice. And I did leave private practice and did start teaching at Georgetown. But because of the election of Mr. Trump, I was also prevailed upon to come over to work at the Campaign Legal Center and help build a, a, a strong organization dedicated to promoting and protecting uh, American democracy. So I've had two jobs for the last seven years uh, and been quite busy. <laughs> what are your primary duties? What do you, sometimes you talk schmoes like me, but what do you, are, are you still arguing cases at this point? Are you supervising lawyers who do? Are you, are you fundraising? Are you managing staff? What are, what are the, it's what's your portfolio? Of, it's all of those things. I've, I've argued three or four of the biggest cases in the last few years, but mostly it's, uh, we've built up a very substantial group of, of very talented lawyers in the range of 40 or 50 at this point. And so I try to keep an eye on what everybody's doing, but they're off running around trying cases and arguing cases all over the country. Uh, and, you know, there's lots to do in the democracy space these days. Yeah. I don't know if, I don't know if that's because it was a growth center or a crisis center, but <laughs> I, I do want to say thank you because we've been, you know, been working on campaign finance reform in my home state now for a long time and CLC has uh, Oregon. Ah, and, yes. and, and it's, and it's actually hot as we speak. In fact, when I saw you come back, what, the, the, the timing, the timing is odd. And I don't know even if you, if, if that rolls up to you, if you're even aware of all that stuff, but literally over the last uh, 48 hours, 70 hours, there's been, oh. there's been a, there's been a push for decades to try to get it. We have no caps on campaign contributions in Oregon. Right. And so there's been a, a push to get them. And finally, now there's been a, uh, there's a ballot initiative that was passed in order to make it clear that the Constitution would allow it, the state Constitution would allow it. Now there is there are competing initiatives on the ballot, uh, one that is done by the good government folks. Uh, that's the one I've been helping with. And then another one done by some more powerful folks who I kind of want to block that one. Right. But it also has some good stuff in it. But more recently, uh, what's happened over the last 70 hours is that the uh, uh, is that the biggest campaign spenders have come together in the legislature and offered honestly, pretty bad proposal. In fact, a very bad proposal, but in the hopes of blocking the things that are out on the ballot that people could vote for. And that was just, they're having a special one month uh, session. We do that, right? We have a long session, short session, short session is about a month. And that short session is happening right now. And they're going to try to see if within a span of a week, they can develop, argue in favor of, and pass, and then move forward to implement a, 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 a not very good piece of legislation. And I want to say thank you to your organization because you have been uh, not only the most trusted, but also the sort of the smartest folks on thinking about good policy on campaign finance limits, et cetera. I'm fortunate, first of all, to have enough resources that we're still fighting the good fight on campaign finance, along with voting yeah. rights and gerrymandering and a lot of other things. Uh, but we do have people whose job it is to keep an eye on and, and get involved with state level reform just of that kind. I know they've been involved in Oregon without taking a side. I, I don't think on any one uh, of the initiatives at this point, but we no, they just, they just private, uh, private information. And what I try to do is just say, Hey, listen, uh, let's try to have the wonks tell the hacks what to do. Let's try to have, let's try to have the people who are actually worried about policy. Let's try to give power to the best answers, right. Rather than just manipulate the best answers on behalf of power. So that's, that's, you know that's why this court sits. Uh, but I, but I, I speak that from from gratitude, and also thanks for how you're spending your time genuinely, because that is because that's what I thought the practice of law was going to be like. I thought there were more folks like you who I did. I, I thought there were more folks like you who kind of moved in and out of government, not only as a client as as a client building uh, mechanism, but actually as a manifestation of service, and maybe why they went to law school in the first instance. Sure. Not only so they could not only so they could retire with a place of the Hamptons, but so they could have some in, positive impact on democracy. What a, uh, how do you how do you see the state of the practice of law right now? 
the the culture of of young people of all ages who are moving into it and who are addressing maybe their core values about why they got into it. Do you reflect on these things at all? I'm at least curious. Well, you know, I, I teach at a law school at Georgetown. And so I see young people going into the law all the time and they are going into it for all the same reasons that, that we did, which was to uh, try to make the world a better place to be able to, to solve important social problems uh, and, uh, they then go off into uh, practice, and in many cases, they find ways to do that. I think, it, especially in D.C., as you say, the people some people do it in the context of private law firms and then go into government for a while, or maybe they go to a nonprofit for a while. Um, I, I actually think that the legal profession, uh, while hardly perfect, it doesn't get the credit it deserves for all the free work it does, for all yeah. the important services it gives. Uh, and a recognition of, of the fact that, you know, lawyers play such a central role in, in both the good and, and bad aspects of what happens in this country. I, I want to play name game just for a moment because they're next generation folks and Kyle can cut it if he wants to. Do you <laughs> by any chance know uh, either Brad Snyder um, or Alex Aronson? Well, Brad Snyder teaches here at Georgetown with me. Uh, All right. So he, he and I clerked together. Uh -huh. So he was different yeah. judges, same, same time, same building. And, and he's, and he's associated Jenner with me when I was there. Oh, was he really much younger than me, but, uh, but certainly was there at, at one point. Oh, I, so I had no idea. All right. So, so Brad was on this program, right? We, he and I talked, he and I go way back. He wrote, and, and it's even one of the reasons it's on my mind because he wrote democratic justice about Felix Frankfurter, right. And about, about the, the effort to take to to use the to use your terms of the good parts of the legal profession and try to put it into put those human beings into government service right and and that's been on my mind a little bit before talking to Brad but a lot since and 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 the other is uh, well no I should I should pause there in case you wanted to say anything before I moved on to Alex no 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 I think that's a real good example of when lawyers were called upon to move into public service and try to really save the country back in the depression and by the, by FDR and the New Deal. And it's a really important story. I'm glad Brad told it. And, and it feels like that's to me where we are, not because it's World War II or hopefully not World War III, but because I think we are, as you have demonstrated by how you are spending, you know, this portion of your career in, in this is a time when we have to be saving democracy. Am I overstating that? Unfortunately, I don't think you are, but I, I will say that there are an awful lot of people, including an awful lot of lawyers who are recognizing that and have recognized that. Uh, and we are, you know, working together hand in hand to try to make sure that the democratic outcome actually produces the next elected president. Uh, and that's obviously not as much of a given as we used to think it was. Uh, and lots of other people are contributing in other ways. Um, I, I think it is a time of mobilization uh, on the part of an awful lot of good people who care about democracy. So the other name is Alex Aronson. And if you don't know him, you should meet him. So he is now, he was chief counsel to Sheldon Whitehouse. The reason I know him is he worked yeah, for me years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and he is now the executive director of the of a public interest nonprofit that is working to make sure that there's a pro-democracy uh, movement within the judiciary and making sure hopefully that at least some larger share of the public conversation is aware of what's been happening to uh to the capture of the courts right. so anyway it's uh th these these are folks who, uh, you know i like to trump it when i have a chance great so in terms of what the campaign legal center is up to uh, voter suppression voter access big piece of it uh, as you mentioned stuff some resources to mess around with to help with uh campaign finance what's the what's the size of the organization how many people work there we're about 90 now uh, and oh, wow. uh, have gotten a budget that's grown considerably in the last seven years. You know, I was basically brought on to help build it into a real litigating force. And we've, we've done that. And we have very, very um, um, high level communications operation and fundraising, obviously, is necessary, other things. So it's probably 80, 90 people now, I think. 80, 90, I think, is, is the right number. And, and it's a large it's a large a, organization. And nice when we, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a large organization. We, you know, I had to. At our peak, in our peak voting year, I think we ended up having you know 60, 70 people on the payroll. At the uh, at, uh, and and better than that, if you talk in, in terms of in terms of nationwide difference between what you, uh, one of the things you have to do though is uh, 
you're needing to have highly, not only highly professional people, but people who's, if you're hiring lawyers, their other career alternative is not one that's a minimum wage job, right? Like you're having to, you're having to pay sufficiently so that they can pay an existing mortgage uh, and they're willing to do it. But you're also probably not competing on money when it comes to recruiting these people. No, you can't. I mean, law firms are uh, so so much in a different space in terms of uh, how much they pay. So you have to offer people the opportunity to do something they really love on a full time basis. And you know you can do things you love at law firms, but it's not full time. There are going to be other things you have to do just to pay the bills. You can do a little bit of it. And so, what's how how long do people tend to stay? Is it is it and at what stage of their career is it? And maybe it's with eighty people, ninety people, it's all over the map. But how many of those folks are, you know, people sort of in your circumstance who've kind of made their nut and now have a now have a chance to to live their values full time to a greater degree? How many of his people like early on say, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this right away? How many people are doing it as sort of a, a stint and then go back to private practice or something else? If you were going to characterize it, how would you characterize it? Mean, obviously, we're we've grown very fast. So we don't have a huge track record with tons of, of people who are lawyers. who We don't know yet. <laughs> but the answer is we have mostly young people who have yeah. decided to come here. From, a, from law school, from a clerkship, uh, maybe from a law firm for a couple of years, but not not uh, not people like me who have been at, out in, the, in the, the firm world for a very long time or taking a break. There is a, There are other organizations that have different models, and there is a movement to kind of employ retired senior partners in this kind of nonprofit world, and some of that is happening, in, in, but not so much in our organization, because other than me. <laughs> No, I, I dwell on it and also express gratitude about it because I really do. Uh, I, mean, I think the the mechanisms of how movements are built are interesting to me. It's one of the reasons I appreciate these conversations. Uh, and I and I, do, I think we agree that there's a critical time for democracy and it's going to take uh, lots of people who uh, who have been able to, and I don't want to criticize any of us, but who have been able to have the luxury of free writing upon the public interest work of others or upon the public interest foundation work, a small left foundation that was, you know, built in decades past, and realizing, oh, we, we can't, we can't just skate by. Somebody's got to do this stuff. So, doing I, it. but, 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 yeah, and thank you for that. So, back to your work or some of the CLC work, some of the campaign legal yeah. center work. You recently released a voter purge legislative resource guide. The term might be descriptive enough. Uh, but for interest democracy nerds out there who might not be aware, say more about what we mean when we say voter purge. Well, a, a voter purge is just a, 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 a part of what happens when states engage in what's known as list maintenance. When, when you have people registered to vote, um, you're going to end up with people registered in your state or in your county who have died or have moved away and uh, their names should no longer be on the list. So you have to do... Um, some maintenance of the list and if you know you try to find out information about people where there's are they still there are they still somebody who should be uh, registered to vote in this location uh and so that's a perfectly legitimate practice indeed not doing that you end up with uh, a, a registration list that's mostly ineligible people many of them no longer alive and that's a mess you don't want that on the other hand it has to be done right and so this is an area again where we have seen in recent times uh, use of the power to purge voters uh, as a way that seems to be designed to uh, affect the outcome of elections. And, and so the, the one thing that we have in our, our toolkit that we developed with a bunch of our allied groups, uh, we really emphasize there uh, is that you should not be purging people just because they haven't voted for six years. That's, that's become a practice that some states do. Uh, and, you know, the sort of creates a presumption that if you haven't voted for six years, you're no longer out there. And it's often just not true. So that's the kind of thing that we try to fight against in the voter purge area. And what does that fight look like? Is that going to county clerks and say, don't knock them off the ballot? Is that going to courts and say, don't let county clerks knock them off the, knock them off the ballot? What is that? You know, what is the blocking and tackling of that look like? Some of it happens with going to legislatures in the states and telling them you shouldn't do this or to the secretaries of state. I ended up arguing a case in the U.S. Supreme Court on this very issue involving Ohio's practice of uh, purging people after six years of non-voting. Uh, and, you know, if you got they would send you one snail mail letter. And if you didn't respond, you uh, uh, you were thrown off. And oftentimes you would go to vote later on uh, and Thousands and thousands of people in Ohio showed up to vote for Obama and found out they weren't registered voters. 
are there, what are the legal steps should be taken if a voter is purged? And part of the challenge is, is this somebody, and it's not like everybody's, not everybody's a democracy nerd, right? Not everybody's got the, and certainly not everybody is a, not everybody is a, you know, is, is a, uh, somebody who's been paying attention to democracy, legal policy and public policy for the last, you know, number of years. It's like, oh, it's like one other thing that comes in the mail. It's one other thing they do in their life. It's one other thing. And like, if they got lots going on, it might be the thing they don't quite get around to. So right. that, them calling you guys up and said, hey, I want to get back on the ballot. And it's not really kind of how it goes, I suspect. Well, but, it's, probably, it's not that hard. You just have to be, as you say, enough of a nerd to be vigilant about it. You have to check yeah. and see whether you're on the registration list. And that's usually something you can do online. Uh, and then there's there's nowhere where you can't re-register. You just have to go, you know, you have to go back in with proof of residency and that sort of thing to get back on the registration rolls. But you have to do it in time to vote for the, the in the election that you care about. And the, there are oftentimes people who just don't find out or in time or don't take steps in time and don't end up voting. I just want to address and get your thoughts on threats of violence and intimidation directed at elections officials and poll workers, poll workers, typically volunteers. Uh, this past week in the Washington Post, there's a story about how election workers are going on offense, I think was the story, to protect the vote in the next election in 2024 in response to various threats. I assume this is on your radar screen. W what is this symptomatic of or what even just what first comes to mind other than confusion or rage? Well, you know, it, I think it's a symptom of the this this claim that so many have, have been making that the system is corrupt uh, and that there's massive fraud in, in the election system. Uh, that Joe Biden didn't win the election, et cetera. Uh, this leads people to conclude that the people running the system must be corrupt as well. Uh, and, you know, it's unfortunate, more than unfortunate, it's terrible because, you know, these election workers are the essential ingredient that makes the system operate. They're the whole backbone of our, our system. And they're getting uh, abused and threatened as if they're, you know, when they say we're counting the votes fairly or you're, you're part of the problem, you're not part of the solution, et cetera. It's, it is uh, unfortunate. And I think we're going to see more of it this year than we've seen in the past uh, as people get uh, angrier, angrier and angrier about the presidential race as it seems to be developing as a rematch between Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump and uh uh, then, you know, with all the other things going on, criminal prosecutions and uh, more claims of fraud, it's just it's getting pretty inflamed out there. And it's it's not an easy job to be an election worker right now. What should we be doing to address or prevent such threats? Well, one of the things we're doing is working in, with with states to pass laws, making it um, a more serious offense to do things to, like harassing election workers and a number of states including important uh, swing states like Nevada and Michigan and Pennsylvania have passed such laws this year. There is a recognition, and it's it's not entirely partisan at all, that th this is something we need to uh, try to suppress and, 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 and make difficult or make and certainly punish when it occurs because you, you really can't operate the system if people won't uh, take these jobs. And many of them do it for nothing. You know, they come vote, as, they just operate as poll workers as, as a public service. Uh, and they don't deserve to be mistreated when it happens. But but states are moving to take steps to try to deter this. I have a, a chicken and egg set of thoughts in my own head, and there's except that the chain is more complicated than a single chicken and a single egg. That is the first thing that needs to be done. You know, it's kind of like who started the fire. It is the first thing that needs to be done. We protect the ballot. It is the first thing to be done. We address communications capacity so that a, a, there's a there's a greater share of shared values or at least shared factual understandings in the country or doing to build grassroots capacity so that in fact pro-democracy folks are more likely to be in earlier stage elective power or does it go even earlier so we've got to make sure there that wealth disparities aren't growing with to, to such a degree that oligarchic capital could just buy democracy cheaper and cheaper relative to their overall budgets right and I can go you know, right I, I mean I and I and I probably could go further with smaller and smaller eggs or bigger and bigger chickens yeah. but 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 where do you and and as somebody who's had to argue case for the Supreme Court, one of the strengths you will obviously have is your ability to focus, not try to do everything, as Thoreau would say, but to do something. As you think about the most recent, the most nearby 
uh, co-tenants in a shopping mall of saving democracy, right? Like who are who are your adjacencies that to you are like you're rooting on most uh, most fervently, but might not be the 91st or 92nd employee or the fourth or fifth program at the Campaign Legal Center. What else are you thinking is really important that needs to be happening out there? Well, I think that you mentioned it. We really need to start educating people to understand that that, that democracy works, that uh, the outcomes that, that are being uh, produced by our system are legitimate and fair and honest and and, and to and to come back to be believers in democracy because there's an awful lot out of people out there now who are no longer really committed to democracy and also who think that the American democratic system is thoroughly corrupt and terrible. And it's just not true. Uh, and so we, we are one of the, we're doing a certain amount of this education, but it, I think it's something that's going to take a generation to fix because uh, it's been so ingrained in the minds of so many people uh, that that it's going to be a long term struggle to get people's faith in the democracy back. And uh, that that is essential. Ultimately, you can't have the system work if people don't believe in it. What have I missed? What are areas of focus for the organization, which wouldn't be a perfect laundry list of the kind of emergent battles around democracy, but at least would be a short list about which people should be aware? Well, we have uh, a, a group of people who spend their time dealing with redistricting, uh, with making sure there are equal opportunities for people of color to elect candidates of choice or also address partisan gerrymandering. We have we we are very centrally involved in the case in the Wisconsin Supreme Court that's trying to finally fix the Wisconsin Assembly district map, which is the most egregious gerrymander I have ever seen, and has been essentially in place now for fourteen years and producing completely uh, public policy that is completely at odds with the political leanings of the people in that state. Um, that we have um, people who worry about efforts to make it harder for people to register and vote. We have a big trial in Arizona about that recently. Uh, then, of course, as we mentioned, the, the campaign finance system is, is, is not strong and needs to be pushed to do a better job to prevent money from dominating in the way that it sometimes does. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, this year we also have a whole program of trying to make sure that the election is uh, stolen between election day and inauguration day. The, the lesson of 2020 is such that we, we want to be as vigilant as we can be to be on guard to make sure that the right electors are chosen and they're, when they vote, those votes are counted by Congress and the right person takes office. Whatever the people decide, uh, we're not partisan in that sense, but that that is a a minimum of what we have to do right now is worry about those things. So, so let's, you use the word partisan. Let me dwell there for a moment. When, uh, when I first started paying attention to this stuff, it seemed to me that the most transpartisan, to say nothing of bipartisan, uh, the most fundamental foundational uh, agreement point that I would have with my um with my justice Rehnquist enthusiast friend uh, would be that at least we're together on the idea that democracy is something that we should have and care about and work on and it never occurred to me it, it, it occurred to me in the deep south right and not even just the deep south that trying to disenfranchise black voters and not just black voters is not a new thing right but but nonetheless, it uh, I had this sense there was at least a seventy percent consensus, maybe better than that, uh, that hey we're we're all kind of trying to be in on the same joke and just trying to make sure this is this is working. How do you navigate that now? And you clerked for Justice Powell, who was nobody's fire haired socialist. Right. Oh. Justice, Justice Powell, who before that wrote the Powell memo that helped lay out much of the uh, either predict or either predict, anticipate or even help to shape, which has become much of the modern conservative movement. Uh, yeah. How do you now see there's a million questions I could ask about this. I, and I actually do want to ask about about Justice Powell before that. 
uh, how do you now see sort of the partisan landscape and how do you navigate that landscape to be able to have democracy values, not just one political party values, but at the same time, not pretend that this stuff is 50-50 equivalent, symmetrical, and everybody's working towards the same end of having a strong democracy? You know, a big part of our brand is to be nonpartisan slash bipartisan. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, our president and founder was was is a Republican. He was McCain's general counsel. He was also chair of the Federal Election Commission as a Republican. Common cause was was invented by a Republican, right? Yeah. Same same sort of story. Uh, Keep going. We we try very hard to not let partisanship come into our decision making or anything like that. Uh, it is true that it's challenging these days in that the people who are most likely to be interfering with uh, democracy or losing faith in democracy tend to be on one side of the aisle and not the other. Uh, and that's just the way it is, thanks to Mr. Trump and a lot of his friends, frankly. Uh, and so, uh, but, you know, we there are many other people in the re conservative movement in the, in the Republican Party who are still strong, fervent believers in democracy and are frankly appalled at some of the things that are going on. So, you know, we try to find those people and build, build allyships with them and use their um, trust as them as trusted messengers because those are the people that get listened to when you try to convince people to come back and you know continue their adherence to democracy their belief in the system all, all the things that are going to make the system work if uh, if we can save it clicker for a judge I, I was going to say is and i'm fair to say is but at least can be a precious relationship Right. Yeah. My the judge for whom I clerked passed away recently. Uh, it, I was there with his wife, along with lots of other clerk, his former clerks. And and we even said in the, he had such, he had a strong marriage. He, he, he was born 50 years to the day from me. So I always remember what his birthday was. And he died at the age of 99. And I thought he died at the age of 99 because he thought to be arrogant to if he lived to 100. John Wooden had the same had the same feeling. I worry Jimmy Carter may have the same. But the uh, and, and she just passed away. Uh, recent, you know, like within within months of him passing away and within days of this conversation. So it's on my mind. And so and, and with that in mind, of course, you're, I, I, my assumption would be that your relationship with Justice Powell would be a, would be a special one, one that you'd honor and, and of course, confidence as you would not betray. Uh, and as I think about the the sort of trajectory of American politics and the trajectory of of even the conversation around democracy, Lewis Powell played a really important role. And I suspect had a trajectory in his own life, a trajectory in his own values, a trajectory in his own. And, and I would be fascinated even to have a conversation with him in the year 2024 about where he sees sort of the state of politics now. What, what, how has that experience at least shaped you or as you have fake com real conversations that happened already or fake conversations in your head with your, with your former uh, just well, you know, clerks. Justice how do you think about it? Say when he was in, in practice, was tended to be a, a conservative fellow who wrote this memo that got the the Chamber of Commerce to get involved in writing amicus briefs and all that that sort of thing. As a, as yeah. a justice, he was um, a centrist of really a kind of a balancer centrist, the precursor to Justice O'Connor and then to Justice Kennedy, uh, a person that I didn't agree with all the time, but often did. Uh, and a person that you could respect for always trying to get it right uh, in what, and, and had the country's best interest in mind 100% of the time. Uh, and so he was a very easy person to click for, even as a person more liberal than him, as, as I was then, and I guess I still am. Um, and um, he, he, he did grow in the job. As, as a corporate lawyer, he didn't know much about the Constitution when he came in and had to Kind of figure it all out as, as time went on. Uh, and he, I think, kind of harkened back to the, he was from Virginia, the, the Virginia tradition of Thomas Jefferson and belief in individual rights and oftentimes would, would get to a good answer that way. So I, it was a wonderful relationship. Um, and, you know, in terms of betraying confidences, he put every single memo in his files up on the internet when he after he passed. So it's all at Washington Lee. You can you can see every memo I ever wrote him or, 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 or it, it oh, is wow. pretty it is it is almost strange to see all that stuff 40 some years later uh, out there to be read by anybody at any time. No, oh, that's amazing. So that means because that's that's actually fascinating. So I, I also I also clerked for a Republican appointed judge. 
and the uh, who was more conservative than I, but same thing, right? Would would um, had had expressed expressed concerns about the direction of of the of the partisan divide it, it, during his during his lifetime, and and was not probably by the end of his life probably considered certainly by conservatives as a conservative judge, uh, but uh, but but certainly viewed himself as such, uh, and. Uh, and I don't like, I'm trying to think back to notes that I wrote <laughs> and I was cognizant. I was cognizant of the professional, it was a professional circumstance. I was, I was cognizant that, you know, that it mattered. So I don't think there'd be anything terribly embarrassing, but yeah, no. And, and, and the fact that stuff that you wrote is now in the federal register, the f- f- stuff that you wrote is now, you know, is, is, is now published material and somebody who cared could go track the origin of that. And they do. <laughs> so as you imagine let's do fears and hopes what are as you in your dour moments now maybe it's in moments when you're uh just concerned maybe it's even as you're having conversations with people who are funding and supporting and doing the work that you do uh What's your dour concern? I don't. I don't use the word prediction, but if we're thinking about kind of confidence intervals and 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 worst, not worst case, but sort of bad case scenarios, where do you fear we might go if things don't go good? Well, that democracy might just fail. Uh, you know, and we have spent since 2020 a lot of time and effort to fix the laws at the federal level, at the state level, to make it harder for people to prevent the democratic outcome in a presidential election from being the one that uh, takes office, but it still could happen. Uh, there, there's an awful lot of people who seem to be more interested in making sure their side is in power than than to follow the electorate. Uh, and so that that I worry about, uh, and you know, an awful lot of people are worrying about whether this is the the, the time when we go from a, a democratic country to a much less democratic country because we're no longer really respecting the will of the people majority rule that's the obviously the thing you worry about so, so to hopes if you're thinking instead about again not best case scenario but but borderline realistic case scenario where you inspire uh, not only fellow colleagues of yours in your generation but also a generation below and two generations below we recapture the uh, the imagination the positive uh, enthusiasm of democracy in the United States how, how do you paint a picture of what the future world could look like that gives you joy or gives you hope well, I, I think we are at a point where if everything goes right, um, we could fix a lot of the flaws in our democracy and begin to rebuild confidence in it. Um, and, you know, a lot could be done by a Congress willing to defend civil rights and voting rights. And, and we just have to elect that Congress and have a president willing to sign that legislation. Uh, there was There's so much that could be done to to fix it. And then once it's fixed to start educating people on why we should be thrilled that we have a better democracy than we had before and and we're and, and be committed to protecting it so I, I i have hopes that all of that good stuff can happen as well it's an interesting inflection point we're at right now as a country any here's my lazy question anything i should have asked you about that i'd be an idiot if i didn't or that i already have it you know, I think we pretty much covered the waterfront, Jeff. I mean, in terms of what is on my mind these days and what we're doing at Campaign Legal Center. But I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk about it. And I, it was nice to have a few digressions into things like clerking for Justice Powell, which I haven't had a, been interviewed about in recent times. <laughs> well, it, it, the, the joy is ours. We've been talking today with Paul Smith, Senior Vice President of the Campaign Legal Center, about legal challenges to the ballot in this year's election and beyond what's happening with democracy. And really, from the heart, man, thank you for what you do. Thank you for taking this time. We really appreciate it. Well, and thank you for being a democracy nerd and letting people know what's going on. And thank you for being a democracy nerd. Oh. Be well. <laughs> and people check out the Campaign Legal Center. Cheers. Take care.